Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Have any of you run into people who mocked you for your Christianity? You stupid Christian, you really believe that? Listen, the gospel is so simple. We'll, we'll go into this next week because Paul is going to have to defend the gospel. It's simplicity. I mean, it gets mocked. It does get mocked. But the preaching of the cross is something that Jesus, I mean, Jesus, everyone, they know John 3.16, right? It's like the most quoted verse of the Bible. For God so loved the world, he did what? He gave his own begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life, right? We, we, we know that. How many of you can tell me two verses before that? John 3, 14. Come on. All right, look. You got Bibles in your lap. Look. See what it says. John 3, 14. I mean, everyone knows John 3, 16, but I'm going to show you the simplicity of the gospel as taught by Jesus himself. By the way, John 3, 14 is the words of Christ. I can cheat and tell you I know why because, see, my Bible has this thing, super cool feature, words of Christ in red. Okay? I, I'm really grateful for that somebody took the time to do that because I, I can see, you know, oh, that's not black. That means Jesus said this. And Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Verse 15. I just want to segue so you can see the lead-in verse to John 3, 16. For he says, So that whoever believes in him will have, what? Eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Now, did you guys know that the God so loved the ver world verse was said by Jesus himself? Uh, see, uh, just a little note. It's right here. It's in red. Jesus is the one who said this. But see, the preaching of the cross by our Lord himself. I thought, you know, some people are like, you seem to always want to get the guy with the most authority in the topic. I'm like, you betcha. So you want to talk eternal life? Let's talk about the guy who knew what he was talking about. Jesus himself. And Jesus, in preaching about the cross... In verse 14, he says there's a teaching about the cross, a really simple teaching. It's from Numbers chapter 21. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You say, well, what's Moses in the serpent in the wilderness story? You, some, some folks don't know this one. For the ones that do, I'll just give you a quick recap. Numbers chapter 21, the Lord has just delivered the Israelites out of bondage to Egypt. Moses is leading them out. They... They face an enemy that is a horrific enemy. They pray, oh, God, help us. Beginning of chapter 21, you know, Lord, if you're really there, if you're really with us, you've got to help us with it. And the Lord lets them put a spanking on the enemy. Is that okay to say? I mean, they, they, they whoop them. They win. So they win. And right after they win, oh, I hate this part. This is, for those of you got, you, you want to see where it is, uh, Numbers 21 then the people, it says, became impatient because of the journey. This is Numbers 21, verse 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Poor Moses. Poor God. He always gets blamed for everything, doesn't he? Man, I hate this journey. It's taking too long. And, they, and they, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to this wilderness? Did you just bring us out here to die? There's no food or water out here? You know, we loathe this miserable food. What food were they eating? Manna. That God rained down from heaven every night for them. They'd find it on the ground they could eat. Angel's food. We loathe this miserable angel food. Stupid guys. Anybody here would like to go back and taste manna? Said it was sweet like coriander with honey. And it would be Hawaiian sweetbread, yeah. Manapuas, but manapua, but mana pancakes. I mean, this, these guys had angel food to cook with, and they complain. 
Not that people ever complain, but this just shows you human nature. Now listen to what the Lord did. This will tell you the story about Moses lifting up the serpent. And Jesus said, this is the very same story for the cross. So you got to think this one through. L let's just see if you can spot what he's signifying here. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents, Numbers 21, 6, amongst the people, and they bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. You're going to complain? I'm going to let the snakes in. Complain? Bite. But, listen to this, the people came to Moses. So the people came to Moses. And they said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord to remove the serpents from us. So Moses interceded for them. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and put it on top of a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will what? He'll live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard. And it came about that if anybody was bit by the serpent, when, when he looked upon the bronze serpent, he lived. Now I find this really interesting because they, it says very clearly, they sinned. And they actually acknowledged that they sinned against God and against Moses. But their answer was, so God, take away the serpents. What was God's answer? Did he take away the serpents? No. No, no, he didn't take away the serpents. Instead, he left the serpents. And if any man was bitten, why do you think they got bitten? Probably still complaining, just a little. You know how people are. Grumble, 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 grumble. Don't grumble, okay. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Wait, they grumble, but a little lower. <laughs> Bite. And the Lord, the Lord, though, he did give him a, an out. He said, Moses, make a bronze serpent. Put it on the standard, you know, on the top of the staff. You can picture one of those long, tall st sticks with the, with the bronze serpent on top. And if anyone got bit, all he had to do to get anti-venom from that poisonous snake, which I love this story because this is better than the other option where I grew up in Arizona when they did... I mean, anti-venom is like, can do a number on your body just like the venom can. It doesn't just undo venom. It's, it like has to break all this stuff down and it's just, the, it's rough. But this, oh, and they use needles too. I hate needles. But this was anti-venom without needles. And this, all this took was what? Just look, right? You just looked at the bronze serpent. But see, if you're mad at Moses, why does Moses get to be in charge? And who put him in charge? It's just not fair. And God sends some serpents to bite him, and then they're going, uh-oh, we sinned. Did anyone die from the bites of the serpents already? He said many died. Now the Lord, they, they cry out, we sinned, we sinned. Can you take away the serpents? I find it interesting God doesn't take away serpents. He doesn't take away the bite that comes from the sting uh, or, or, the, or the, the, the bite that comes from the serpent to the ones who are still sinning. It's still there. But what he does do is make a way for you to not have that sting kill you. That bite caused you to actually die. And he does it in a way, you have to, you have to comply with his rule. You know, but I don't like Moses is in charge and he's the one holding the standard. He's the one with the stick with the serpent on top. By the way, do you know that that stick with the serpent thing, if you want to look on the side of an ambulance, you ever wonder where that symbol came from? There you go. Nephilim. It came from this story in the Bible, Numbers 21. All they had to do was look at the provision that God made and they were healed from that bite that would bring death. Now what did Jesus say in John 3.14? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. D have we been bitten by death in this world, by, by sin? What was the wages of sin? Death. How do we escape it? We have to look to Jesus. 
We have to look to the cross. And I know next week we'll go into how it's foolishness to those that are perishing. But to us that are being saved... Oh, by the way, do you think that there were any stubborn Jews that said, even after they grumbled later and got bit, I ain't looking at that thing Moses is holding. Why does he get to be the guy holding the stick anyway? I don't like that. Ugh. You can die in your sin. But you don't need to. That's the beauty of the gospel, is you do not need to die from the bite of sin in this world because there is an antidote, and it's so simple. All you have to do is look to Jesus on the cross. That's it. It's not complicated. As soon as you look to Christ, what does he do? He saves you. The thief. Lord, remember me when you come into your key. He looks to Jesus. Jesus says, today, this day, you'll be with me in paradise. All it took was acknowledging that thief, acknowledging that he was a sinner and that he needed a savior. That's the beauty, the simplicity of the gospel. Don't ever make the gospel more complicated than that. You add any extra rules to that and you are doing us a disservice because that's the true pure gospel, the good news. All anyone needs to do that is struggling with sin in this world is look to Jesus and he'll save them. Now, I know there's people like to add a lot of extra stuff. But it's not right. It's not what we were designed for. We were designed to be fixed on Jesus. We were designed to be joined to Jesus in the likeness of his death and the likeness of his resurrection so that we too could walk in newness of life. That's the power. And some of you, you've been in the Lord a long time, but somehow some, some vice, some habit has crept in and, or maybe it came back. And on the revisit, it's even gotten deeper in you and you can't seem to buck it. And I'm here to tell you, you need to, well, go back and read the rest of Romans 6 because he says, even so, consider with your mind that you are dead to sin so that you can also consider now that you are alive in Christ Jesus to, to really experience newness of life. You've got to be willing to die to the old ways. You have to die to your flesh. You want to really experience life as it's meant to be in the Lord? It's not meant for you to be in bondage to sin. That sucks. Oops, am I supposed to say that? I mean, it's terrible for you. It's, it's, it's horrible. I know preachers are like, oh no, he said that. <laughs> if that. I want you to have newness of life. I want Dan to have newness of life today. So we're going to go to the water's edge and join our brother to Jesus today. And I'm inviting all of you to be witnesses of that. And as you see him being joined to Christ in these two things... I want to encourage you, if you haven't been joined to Jesus in the waters of baptism, I encourage you, I exhort you, what Paul would say, to do it. Consider it. One of the most freeing things you can do. You know, I know people will teach you, have to be baptized to be saved. I say, get baptized so you can enjoy this life here. A life with freedom from bondage to old junk and that joy that just to walk unencumbered not held back by sin. It is so freeing. Anyone give an amen to that? The freedom that we get when we consider that we died with Christ and that we've risen with Him. May you be able to walk in that resurrected new life this week. You guys have been in... I can look around. I see so many faces I know have in, been in Christ for decades sitting here. But there are some that are new to it. And we got to live like this is real. We can't just keep doing the old stuff and then tell them, oh, you guys shouldn't do the old stuff. You shouldn't participate in the, in the fleshly ways, you know. By the way, does the church at Corinth have any fresh, fleshly problems? And for those of you that have read the book before, any carnality that Paul has to address? Oh, yeah. And see, he's just started towards this, this part. We, well, we'll see where he goes with this. But I assure you, he wants them to be free too. Just like he wanted the church at Rome to be free. Just like I desire that all of you would be free 
from the fleshly things because they just they just trip us up. We don't even realize it. It's like my uncle with his cigarette. The family's pleading, please, you've got to stop. Even just stop, you know, be, just don't smoke in the bed. They couldn't even convince him to stop, you know, like bef maybe you, you're getting ready, brushing your teeth for, for bed. He, I, ugh, he never went to bed with clean teeth because the last thing was always a cigarette in his mouth. But we couldn't, they, they could not persuade. Just stop even before you go to bed so you don't fall asleep and burn the house down. No, nope, can't be done. But once he was dead, it was done. Some of you just need to die. I'm, ta I'm, I'm not talking physically. Oh, no. I had a looks I just got. I got so <laughs> Connie, I have some business cards with me. Some, our mortician, I have some business cards. That's not what I meant. You have to hear what I meant, not what I said. How's that, you know? <laughs> that's one of my, by the way, that's a, that's a tip for you married folks that you learn this saying, okay? Because sometimes as spouses, we're always with each other and we're communicating. Sometimes we bumble it up. I always do because English isn't my first language. So stuff is reversed in Italian from English. And, you know, sometimes I say it backwards and the kids are like, you talk funny, Dad. I'm like, do you know what I meant? And they're like, yeah, we know what you meant, but you said it wrong. Then hear what I meant and not what I said, okay? I want you to die to your flesh this week so you can live life anew in the Spirit. What you were really meant for is to walk in fellowship with our Maker, not in sin. Sin just mucks up our week. And we don't want that. We want you to have a great week this week. This is really could be the best week of your whole Christian experience if you can let this sink in. The word Paul uses when he says consider means to use your mind. You have to think this one through. I've died to sin. Sin shows up. I call this assuming the position that my uncle was in in the casket. Like this. I, I just, in my mind, I picture I'm dead. Rosary right here. You can try to get in my face. I'm dead. Dead to sin, but now, you know, and do people ever poke at you while you're spiritually trying to maintain the dead to flesh? You know, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. Poke, 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 poke. I'm like, I'm trying, stop poking. You know, I don't want to be back in life in the flesh. But once I, once I consider I'm dead like this to sin, now I can do this. I'm alive to you, God. What do you want me to do? And my whole reactions changed radically from the days that I was, before I was saved. If people poked at me before I was saved, I used to tell them, you don't want to fight with me. I'm not nice. I will hurt you. I like to break bones. I like this feel. I like how it snaps. I know how to do it. You grow up with an uncle who's the collector. You know how to do this. And I, I had damage, real damage. So when you're hurt and others come and try to poke at you, what's the natural response? Hurt them back. Do you know how long it took for Christ to work in me to do this? I'm dead to that now. But I'm alive to God. If God can do that with me, this is why, you know, people ask, how did you get qualified for the job? Who made you the pastor? You saw what Paul always was his answer. Paul, an apostle called by the will of who? Of God, not man. Because I'm sure he got some razzing. How did you ever get in the club? Weren't you the guy killing Christians? persecuting them, arresting them, throwing them in jail? How did you get in the club? God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That's why I got picked. Here I am. But you know, the great part of the story is, is God's testimony because he's faithful. 
And if he can work in me, then a lot of folks go, man, I have so much hope because he did it with you. I'm, I'm not even half as bad as you. I'm like, for, go, go, go. Go God, man. That, that's right. That's right. So live it this week. Live the newness of life. Let's go take Dan to the water. Witness him being joined to Jesus. If anyone else wants to join him in the waters of baptism, you can have a turn to. But remember, we're not baptizing you into amazing grace. We're, we're baptizing you into Christ. Okay? That's where the power is. It's joined to Jesus. Let's go over there. See him joined in the Lord. Oh, I forgot. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we just pray you would just make just a sweet visit, a power of your spirit to come upon Dan. Anyone else that might be touched by these words, Lord, that wants to be baptized into you, Lord, that we ask that you would meet them in the waters of baptism, wherever they might seek you out, that they could be joined to your son. And they, too, can experience this death and newness of life that we've been talking about. We pray in your son's precious name. In Christ's name we pray. And everyone that agreed said, Amen. Amen. Let's go. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.